first look at the landscape of the Middle Ages has shown us a little bit about life as it was lived uh, in its relationship between rural and urban values and in its close connection with the rhythms of nature. It's shown a little bit about the way in which the church was operative in the Middle Ages. What we want to do in this lecture is to continue our discovery of the Middle Ages by examining a little bit more of the medieval landscape, and in particular by taking a look at two characteristic institutions that are represented by buildings that we find on that landscape. We're going to look at monastery and we're going to look at castle. And in a sense what we're trying to do is present a map of the Middle Ages, not simply in terms of a geography, but also in terms of a kind of map of major concerns, much in the same way, for example, as if uh, we were doing a map of the uh, United States in the 19th century, we would want to talk about, let's say, for example, the factory, or I suppose now we would be interested if we were doing a map of the 21st century to kind of talk a little bit about Silicon Valley. So we're going to start uh, by talking a little bit about the institution of monasticism. In the year 269 in Egypt, an 18-year-old boy named Anthony was late getting to church. And he got there just as the gospel was being read. And the gospel was, if you will be perfect, sell everything you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And Anthony heard that as a personal call and tried to figure out a way to live that radical call that was addressed to him that day in church. And so he sold everything he had and gave it to the poor, and he went off to live by himself in the desert near his hometown. He lived in the desert for 87 years and died at the age of 105, and Anthony is usually considered as the first monk. Even in his lifetime, however, there were some problems with the way Anthony lived. First of all, since he was not a priest, he was cut off from the sacramental life of the church. And secondly, uh, there are just simply some practical problems of living alone. And third, there are some difficulties for people simply being by themselves all the time. Many centuries later, one hermit wrote to another one and said, if you live as a hermit by yourself and you're a crazy person, the only person you live with is a crazy person. And so in Anthony's lifetime, men and women who chose this radical way of living separated from the world and its values, began to come together and form institutions that we call monasteries, sometimes having thousands of members. And from Egypt, monasticism spread all over the Roman Empire, including, of course, to Western Europe. Ultimately, monasticism was largely institutionalized beginning in the 6th century when a monk named Benedict wrote a rule for his own monastery at Monte Cassino. But gradually, that rule spread throughout Western Europe to the point where Charlemagne's son could ask, is there any other monastic rule than the rule of St. Benedict? And so Benedictine monasticism became one of the most important elements of medieval life. In fact, the early Middle Ages is sometimes referred to as the monastic centuries. So a good place, then, to begin to emphasize some of the differences between uh, the Middle Ages in our own time is to talk about monasticism not because it doesn't exist anymore, in fact it, it does, but because it doesn't exist uh, in anything like the same numbers where literally there were thousands of monasteries dotting the landscape of Western Europe. And it's sort of interesting to think about what went on there. Uh, they were places where a communal life of prayer and work was lived. And they were places where learning was transmitted because learning was necessary uh, both for the liturgical life of Western Europe and for the prayer life of Western Europe, but also because they came to value learning for its own sake. So that you have the very interesting paradox that an institution that was essentially meant for the margins of society. After all, Anthony of the Desert said, I've had it uh, with life in the big city. I'm going off to the desert to live and to pray. Uh, you have 
monastery sort of following his lead and uh, being built in the most out-of-the-way places, you have these uh, marginal institutions growing by the hundreds and even thousands becoming central to the concerns of Europe in the Middle Ages and, in a sense, uh, becoming fundamentally important in, in all kinds of ways uh, in addition to the fact that they were looking out for the spiritual welfare of everyone else. Let's take a look at one. This is the monastery of Saint-Martin du Canigou in the French Pyrenees. It, in fact, will celebrate its thousandth anniversary in two years. It was founded in the year 1002. Well, the obvious thing to say about this photograph is, if you want to get away from it all, this isn't a bad place to go. This is pretty isolated now, as well as a thousand years ago, as you can imagine. And you can see there, there's a church. There is a cloister surrounded by the buildings that provided the practical setting for the monastic life. A place to meet, a place to sleep, a place to eat, and so on and so forth. And it would be easy to see this monastery and others we're going to look at in their isolation and say, well, okay, that's what those guys did, so what for the rest of the world? But one thing to say is, since that in the, middle, in the early Middle Ages, monasteries had something of a monopoly on education, both for monks and non-monks, but primarily for themselves, it meant that the church at large recruited its leaders from these monasteries. And so many, many bishops in the church who went out, therefore, to teach and administer in the church in general were themselves monks or at least were trained in monasteries. This is not just true of perhaps your local bishop. It is also true of several of the most important popes of the Middle Ages. And so what happened in this cloister, and many, many like it, not only shaped what monks did in the Middle Ages, it shaped European society much more generally. I want to add to that uh, one sort of uh, interesting comment about monks and technology. If you take a look at that building, one of the things that's remarkable about it, of course, is the very fact that it has survived. Uh, it's awfully old by this time. It was built in, what, nine? Well, 1,002. 1,002. Okay, so here you have, we're coming up on the thousandth year anniversary of it, and it seems to have survived quite nicely. Uh, just simply as a kind of technological feat, it has to be seen as pretty impressive. Uh, a little sort of jump to the future, a kind of footnote here that might be, I think, important in talking about the influence that monasticism has had. There is a monastery near us, a Trappist monastery, which has about 40 monks or so. And one of the things that's very interesting about it, it's self-sufficient and does things, a lot of manual labor, but they were among the first folks that I know to sort of jump onto the computer revolution. Uh, designing their own website and uh, kind of wiring the monastery. And a lot of people thought this was really weird and incompatible with the lifestyle of the monks. The abbot said, you know, we were the first back then. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be the first now. And so I think it's also important to think of the monastery as a place of technological innovation as well. Let's take a look at perhaps a more famous monastery, one that no doubt many of you have visited or at least seen photographs of. This is Mont Saint-Michel that sits just off the northern coast of France, one of the most famous medieval monastic buildings. Just to pick up where Ron left off at Saint-Martin, if you take a look at this and say somebody or some bodies organized a plan and then executed the plan of building a very big church on top of a precipitous rocky thing that sits out in the water for most of the day. Again, just at that level, this is an impressive achievement and reminds us of some of the things the monks accomplished that were then transferable skills to the society at large. And also, if you take a look at it very closely, you can see that it turns out not to be built in exactly the same architectural style all the way through. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting is it has it parts that we would think of belonging to the Gothic style and parts that would be according to the Romanesque style. Well, it's certainly not the case that they woke up one morning and said, hey, you know, let's change styles. Uh, what happened, of course, is that this is representative of the fact that as of the institution of monasticism itself, so also here in terms of the building, it was done over a very long period of time. Uh, monks 
uh, teach us not to expect or to go for instant results. Uh, and it seems to me that that, too, has to be seen as one of the important ways in which they change the medieval landscape. So one of the things we're emphasizing about monasticism is that monks are quite literally and physically and on purpose set apart from the rest of society. Let's see how far we can push that. That's pretty far. Okay, this is uh, a monastery in Greece, and it turns out that you look at this and you say, uh, I've got a question. Um, how do they get up there? And the other question is, once they're up there, how do they get back down? Uh, if you want to take this idea of separating yourself from society seriously, it's hard to find a more, um, a, a, a more impressive, objective piece of evidence for that. If you go visit there, the monks have a joke. By the way, monks are good at jokes. Uh, the joke is, uh, if you go up and down by rope, how do you know when it's time for a new rope? And of course, the answer is when the old rope breaks. Uh, this is a pretty tough place to get in and out of, as you can see. And this sort of reminds us how far one could carry that tendency, because monks do indeed want to be separate from the world. They want to be separate so that they can live this life that is untrammeled by many of the things that distract the rest of the world from a focus. And God knows monasticism is a focused life. Focus on God and on salvation. Yeah, and indeed, this gives us uh, a clue to the way in which this was a pretty ascetic life. Again, to use an example from uh, the monastery nearby, I remember asking one of the monks, okay, how come you joined up? A person who'd been there for 30, 35 years, and he said, well, you know, I always wanted to do something for the church. I knew I had this vocation, and the monks were sort of like the Marine Corps of the church. I wanted to see whether I had it in me uh, to do this. Now, he further added, he said, the reason that you join is not really the reason that you stay. But the point that he made is a point that certainly would have been valid throughout the Middle Ages, that there was a sense in which the ascetic life that the monks led uh, was deliberately meant to be uh, as rigorous as possible. And in itself, it set a kind of standard uh, for uh, the rest of Europe. So I think we need to take that into account as well in a discussion of the importance of monasticism. But there's another side to the monastic life. While many monks did choose to be as remote as possible, if we take a look at this photograph, which is of the city of Florence taken from the bell tower of the cathedral, in fact, in this photograph, we see not one but two Benedictine monasteries. We are probably not surprised that one of them's here on the hill, and in some sense, over time, the city has grown out a little bit closer to it. So it was probably a bit more remote, although literally within walking distance of the Arno River uh, in the Middle Ages than it seems now as, as sort of the, the roads and whatever have gone up there. The monastery of San Miniato, the oldest church, in fact, still standing in Florence. But the other one, is this building right here with this tall tower. It's called the Badia Fiorentina, the Florentine Monastery. And these Benedictines lived an enclosed life right in the middle of Florence, one of the busiest and most active of the late medieval cities. So in a sense, there's a really interesting paradox here that it is possible to be remote and isolated geographically, as in the other examples, but it's just as possible to be remote if you will, spiritually, that they hadn't changed their mission because they were inside the city. They did not go out and perform works of mercy. Uh, their goal was uh, prayer, sanctification. Uh, their goal was the liturgy. Yet they felt that somehow doing it in the midst of all the hustle and bustle of Florence uh, was an important thing. Uh, and that image of the two monasteries in Florence, I think, makes the point with uh, a good deal of impact. So it's also worth saying that in the United States today, for example, uh, certainly probably most people have never seen a monk and probably most people have never seen a monastery. Again, that's true in our own county where we actually have a monastery. It's off of a uh, of sort of barely paved road. However, if you were living in Florence in the late Middle Ages, let's say in Dante's time, uh, you would have known these monasteries very well, even if you were not a monk, even if you were a merchant or a businessman. Dante lived essentially right around the corner from the monastery where the arrow is on the 
photograph. And Dante, we know, used to climb up to San Miniato because he describes an event in the Divine Comedy where he says, this reminds me of climbing up to San Miniato. So even as urban and lay person like Dante would have had a kind of intimacy with the values and ideals of monasticism that's largely lost today, even to those of the denominations of Christianity that have monasteries. And in fact, Dante's kind of interesting as an example of what we're trying to talk about, this institution at the margins permeating the center, because Dante was this man of the city involved in the hustle and bustle of, urban's life, of urban life. It's impossible to understand his great poem, The Divine Comedy, without seeing the way in which it is permeated by monasticism. One example of it is that the rhythms of monastic life are incorporated in the rhythms of the second part of the Divine Comedy, the Purgatorio. Uh, and uh, so what we see here is the extent to which everybody was conscious of its influence, and it was uh, something that people uh, had in their bones, as it were, in a way that uh, is very difficult for us to understand. Another example, once again staying with Dante, is in the very last canto of the Divine Comedy, when Dante is going to meet God face to face, Dante's last guide to the Virgin Mary and to the Trinity is in fact a monk who lived under the rule of St. Benedict, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, with whose writings Dante was familiar. And I might add, St. Benedict has a very, very good spot in heaven for Dante. Well, we talked a little bit about the monastery as one characteristic building that dots the landscape and defines the institutions of the Middle Ages. Perhaps uh, in, in dealing with the castle, we're dealing with what is most familiar. That is to say, it is probably the building that most people most frequently associate uh, with the Middle Ages. And so here, I think we have to be a little bit careful because we have to sort of ask ourselves, to what extent uh, do popular stereotypes of what castles are and do uh, re reflect the reality uh, of what they did and represented in the Middle Ages? And so in our discussion of the next couple of shots, we're going to be talking about uh, an awful lot of things uh, that are uh, associated with castles. For one thing, we need to remember that what we see today are in large ways the exceptions to the rule. Most castles, that is to say most rural dwellings of nobles of the feudal aristocracy would have been made out of wood and none of them survives, none, zero. So we are looking at the grander ones and by and large the later ones. If you want to know what the landscape looked like a thousand years ago, none of the buildings we're going to show you is going to illustrate that very well. So it's important to remember that we are in some sense looking at the exceptions, the grandest, the most permanently built. This is one of the castles of the Loire Valley. Sometimes we make it sound cool by calling it one of the chateaux of the Loire. Chateau doesn't sound quite as vehement and masculine as castle does. But in fact, you can see that it was largely built for defense. After all, what is now a park in the foreground of this photograph was in fact the moat. And although some of the other castles we're going to see did not have moats, had other kinds of defensive structures, this one did have that characteristic sort of last ring of defense before you actually got there, reminding us that even in the later Middle Ages, castles were, among other things, defensive outposts. And of course, it's easy to see that if we see castles not simply as they're reflected uh, in the landscape, which we literally see, but also in the literature which emerges from them. Because one of the things, of course, that the Middle Ages has produced is a vast literature which we call the literature of chivalry. And the focus for it, of course, is what happens at a castle. Now, there are a number of interesting things to say about it. Bill mentioned uh, quite rightly that what we see are the sort of best of them, okay? Well, our view that all castles must have looked like that is certainly reinforced if we take a look at the kind of castles that we get in medieval literature. For example, any of you are familiar with the stories of King Arthur and his knights, okay, a tradition which remains popular from the 12th century really up to the 20th, uh, you think of these castles as remarkably elegant structures. You think of all of the courteous things that go on inside them. In a way, this has to be seen as a kind of propaganda, really, uh, because everyday life in a castle uh, would have been grubby no matter how elegant on the outside. 
this particular castle comes from the late Middle Ages and, as I said, is in the Loire Valley. Let's take a look at another one. This is a castle named Fenice, and it's in the foothills of the Alps in northern Italy. And, well, that's what it's doing there. It's guarding a pass through the foothills to the Alps. That many castles were, of course, built in strategic locations and had a particular function. And you can see there is a wall with all the crenellations around it. Sometimes that almost looks like it gets lost in the field there that's the foreground. And then there are these great big buildings that sort of rise up over the defensive walls. Well, again, people live there. Probably not very comfortably, we might add. Uh, rooms would have been drafty. Uh, in fact, they didn't have nearly as many rooms. A lot of people lived in the same room because of the need to warm them with fireplaces. You can't have a fireplace just every, every 10 feet or so. So probably, as Ron said, to read about this elegant, comfortable life, or at least especially to hear the modern versions of what it must have been like to live in a castle, are largely, in fact, inventions rather than descriptions of this life. And indeed, one of the ways in which that has come down to us, you go to uh, any museum that has a large collection of medieval stuff, and one of the things that they're likely to have on display are the great and wonderful tapestries. And some of them are magnificent works of art indeed. Very often, the purpose of those tapestries was very practical. As Bill said, castles can get cold and drafty. The tapestries uh, against the wall were one way of warming things up. A sort of nice looking insulation to be sure, but nevertheless insulation. One question we might ask is, who lived in these things? Obviously not the majority of the rural population. This was for the feudal aristocracy, this social group that was set aside for defense. That somebody who lived in a castle of this size probably was in fact a titled member of the nobility and then he would depend on smaller knights who lived in much more humble circumstances to join him so many days a year as part of their military obligation which they which is what their payment is for having use of the land of the unfree or semi-free peasants who farmed the land and most of the produce of that land. So these are monuments to what we sometimes call the feudal system. Now medievalists are a little bit touchy about that term feudal system. It sounds like something that was designed from above. It sounds sort of centralized and it sounds like it worked the same way more or less every place. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you will, there's nothing systematic about feudalism because the various arrangements that arose, although there are some parallels from different parts of Europe, arose in response to the particular needs of localities, whether it was Vikings coming from one way or Muslims coming from another way across the Mediterranean, or whether it was local warfare, whether it was guarding a particular piece of geography like a pass through the Alps, or whether it was out on flat ground or on top of a mountain, the relationships that developed between the various levels of this feudal era aristocracy makes anything like the term feudal system uh, a sort of modern anachronism that we impose with some danger on the Middle Ages if we're trying to understand that society from the inside. Notice also, of course, that most of the literature that develops in castles develops in this sort of top-down model uh, that corresponds to what has remained because it would only be uh, the more wealthy members of the aristocracy who could have the time or indeed the leisure to have a court poet, let's say, who is writing about them. But also the sorts of things uh, that these poets wrote, uh, very often they were themselves clerics who were attached to a royal household, uh, would write things that would largely tend to be um, very sympathetic uh, to the way of life that was idealized there. Uh, and also, we have to remember it was often literature that had as its purpose kind of reminding the people who were there that there was a code of conduct that they needed to follow to set an example as leaders. Well, sometimes we make the mistake of reading this literature and sort of thinking that that reflects a reality rather than reflecting an ideal. What medieval literature, especially courtly literature, tended to do was to treat the ideal uh, and uh, what we need to do is to sort of understand that when we're reading the literature. And I think that would be particularly true when we're reading all of the literature connected with uh, King Arthur uh, and the exploits of his knights.
If we think about this feudal society, which I suppose in its heyday was in the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries, one of the reasons for these fortresses that scattered around the countryside, one of the reasons that local nobles grew to have such great power is because of the fact that defense had to be localized. If your local neighborhood was invaded by Vikings who pulled up on a ship, got out, looted a little bit, and then loaded up their boats and headed off, well, it doesn't do any good to send a messenger out to the king to say, could you send us some reinforcements? By the time the messenger got there, the Vikings were already gone. And so many times these castles remind us of a time when Europe became, for defensive reasons, quite decentralized. You wanted somebody around who could, in fact, go out and try to defend against those who would attack. And whoever can defend you is probably a person you're going to look to for other things, for example, such as justice uh, in a kind of court system that developed. But look what happens. Here is a castle in Salzburg, Austria. Some of you may have seen it as the background to the sound of music and expect to see uh, Julie Andrews sort of flitting along there with seven kids wearing drapery. But at any rate, uh, look at that thing. It's a great defensive place. It's a great place to rally the troops. It would be a very difficult place to take. That's great for you. Yeah, in fact, uh, if we point a little bit closer here, you can see that all of those little notches there are really essentially different stories. Uh, so that what you're dealing with is something that is really quite huge. And once again, a reminder, as we did with the monasteries, that uh, these are extraordinarily uh, sophisticated technological achievements, uh, which were meant to deal with, as Bill's been saying, very specific problems and very specific issues uh, of defense uh, and uh, of fortification. Now, what happens when the invaders of the sorts that really threaten these areas disappear? What's the raison d'etre for having a place like that? And later on in the Middle Ages, all over, there were kings or sub-kings, if you will, who wanted to organize and centralize certain kinds of authority. Imagine how hard that is to do if the local noble says, I'm not playing your ball game. What are you going to do about it? What would you do about it? Uh, if, in fact, that was the place where you had to take in order to centralize authority. So what were very important bastions of power in the earlier Middle Ages became, in fact, threats to the stability that was being created by these larger political entities later in the Middle Ages. We want to look at one more castle, and this is the castle of Carnarvon in Wales. Enormous, as you can see by looking at the boats and whatever in the foreground. But Wales was essentially captured territory by the English kings in the 13th century. And therefore, they needed these enormous fortresses, not just to house a noble, but to house their troops and their equipment to keep Wales under English domination. There are a whole string of these 13th century castles in Wales where that was their function. And in fact, what's sort of interesting about that is that they find a kind of analog in the sort of castles that were built by crusaders to do exactly the same thing. That is to say, to hold on to captured territory uh, in the Holy Land. And so we see them kind of exporting an idea from the Holy Land and sort of taking it and making it domestic. Uh, one way in which the crusades sort of changed the life of Western Europe. So here we have an example of a castle from the 13th century that serves a somewhat different function than those earlier medieval castles uh, that were largely the homes of individual nobles and places of refuge for those who lived around them. Well, we have taken a look in this lecture at two of the most characteristic kinds of monuments on the medieval landscape. But we're not just looking at monuments. We are taking a look at two of the most important institutions of medieval life, two that are commonly associated with the Middle Ages, monks and knights, but very often not very well understood. And so uh, when we move on to talk a little bit about um, cities and towns, which will be the subject of our next lecture, it will be interesting there to see uh, the contrast that is provided by uh, a kind of what, what are we going to call a counter to what we're seeing here, uh, but to keep in mind the way in which uh, the ideals that are represented by monasticism and by feudalism permeate the Middle Ages 
permeate its literature, its spirituality, its social institutions, and in fact go beyond them. 